time for Wednesday's hour number two on Hashtag Daily K with your host, Peter Bint. Korean dramas, movies, and even lyrics. Why is the world paying attention to Korean stories? From classics to modern masterpieces, time to dig deep into the charms of Korean literature. Go on, check it out! With Paul. Today's book, not on that long list. Uh, no, no, but it's a very good book. It's um, a tale that I think is true. Oh. It's never, it's never sort of explicitly stated, mm. but I think it is. It's from writer Lee Mungu, and uh-huh. it's called Yuja Sojun, a brief biography of Yuja. And no, it's not about citrons and citron tea, Peter. Which before you get what started, Yuja Yuja Cha can be translated to. No, no but it's that's not what we're translating no. here. We're no. talking about Dehua. I'll explain when oh. we get after our first reading conversation the meaning of Yuja. Okay, and it's about this. Quite curious man with a curious life, which he's dedicated to basically learning how to do everything and helping others. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Uh, Eat Mungu, we've done before our first time. No, our first time featuring him. Um, in fact, this is the this is the only standalone work that's been published in English. Oh. A couple of his short stories have featured in collections, but this is the only one you can sort of get your hands on when it's just him. Mm. Um, he was born in 1941 in Boryong in Chungcheong Namdo Province. Um, And he grew up in really hard times. Before the Korean War, his grandfather was teaching him classical texts and he was getting into literature. But then after the Korean War, his father was associated with the left Uh and that led to his execution and also two of his older brother's execution as well. Oh, no. His mother and uh, grandmother died soon afterwards. He just about survived, went to Seoul, worked as a day labourer, started selling dried goods on the street. Mm. And he dreamed of being a writer. And he heard there were ways that he could get help. Mm -hmm. And he managed to get into college. Nice. And then he made his debut in 1965. And he kept on publishing. And he published really interesting works. He focused on what industrialization and Western modernity were doing to Korea. Ah. How they were undermining the traditions and the ways of life of Korea. And so in a lot of his work, you get these sort of these battles between culture and nature or rural versus urban. Mm. Um, and so for the next three decades, he wrote and wrote and wrote. He passed away in uh, 2003. And yes, we have this one story to share with you, but it's a very good one. And it's translated by Jamie Chang, who's been on the show many times. Uh, yes, we featured her a number of times. The last time was a very short story at the start of February. Um, uh, she's a brilliant translator. She's been doing this for 10 years now. Um, and her translations, I mean... We've the the last big one we featured was by Cho Namju the Saha, uh-huh. um, but then Son Won Pyeong, Kim Ae Ran, Park Soo Young. She's done so many. Um, she's a lecturer at Ewa Women's University and at the Literature Translation Institute of Korea. I think she's a brilliant translator. I'm looking forward to whatever she does next because mm. this is an older translation. Okay. So hopefully we'll have a new one to show, share with you. I don't know this year, next year. Fingers crossed. Ms. Come Chang, on, Jamie. Get in touch. Uh, Shall we get straight into the first reading? Is this towards the beginning of the tale? This is the very beginning of the tale. Here we go. There was once a friend. At first glance, he was a fellow no different from any other. But... uh, He wasn't your average nobody who wiled his life away, living to pay the bills and leaving no name for himself in this world. His name was Yu Jae-pil. He was born in 1941 in Guangchun, Hongsong-gun, and grew up in Daechon, Boryong-gun. He spent his adulthood in Seoul. Since childhood, he was preternaturally insightful and brave. This set him apart from his peers and saw him through his humble beginnings and luckless family situation. Far advanced for his age in many ways, his boyhood was characterised by outstanding precocity, his adolescence surprising competence, and his adulthood downright venerability, the foundation for an enlightened man among ordinary men. He was both distinctive and incorruptible. He had a cheerful, wholesome disposition to begin with, thoughtful and calm in every situation. He added his first-hand experience and extensive second-hand knowledge to his good, steadfast character to develop his own principles and opinions that afforded him an unwavering constancy. He treated freeloaders and meddlers 
like wet rags in the monsoon, and despised finaglers and the high and mighty with the passion of a reader waiting for Cow Cow to die in Romance of the Three Kingdoms. When he came across someone too cowardly and calculating to speak their mind in situations where they had to speak with confidence or boldly admit ignorance, UJ Peel spat on them, as he would on a miserable miser who charged interest on a debtor who had just sent his fully grown daughter to Seoul to seek employment. The list of his greatness went on. He was a man of lasting impression, warm disposition and sober constitution. He grieved over the sufferings of his fellow men as though the sufferings were his own, but had the wisdom to protect their dignity rather than offering charity. To borrow an old phrase, he was Tung Dip Dong Hing, solitary path of unyielding principles incarnate. The paragon of gentlemanly virtue who lived by the code of recognising the woes of others before they themselves could and rejoiced only when everyone was content. Lee, this is you, was his invariable greeting each time he called. But he wasn't just you. He was Yuja, or Master Yu. And we had lots of messages coming in. Um, Tigerish, uh, I think you, it's up to you. I think you will like the character by the end. It sounds like gushing praise yeah, for this, this is, person. This is a, a eulogy. Uh huh. In some ways. Okay. This is a, this is sort of a, a, a chance for him to talk about his friend. And it does seem to be a real person. All right. So in the end. This is not fiction. This is him describing uh -huh. his friend and, and his life. Who is not just you, but you, Jar, or Master You. Yes. What's, um, what do we mean? Well, as a kid, He's a bit of a fool. Okay. <laughs> but then he turns into what you might call a master of life. Oh. He's able to adapt to any situation. Mm. And he'll learn about anything that he needs to. Okay. And he thrives in the oddest of circumstances. <laughs> As we go through his life, you'll see what I mean. Okay. Um, so he's... Yuja is friends with lots of writers. Mm. Um, and they love him. Because okay. he's got this breadth of knowledge. Wow. Like when it comes to old dialects that have disappeared, uh -huh. he can tell you the words that people used to use and what they meant. Wow, and very smart. Yeah, and he's got all sorts of facts and stories. He's a really good font of information. Mm. And the narrator even says, look, I even based a short story on him oh. when it was from his time as a kid. And then he starts talking about his time as a kid. Mm. Um, and Yuja was always getting into trouble uh -huh. uh, at school. And when he made his mind up, he was going to do something. You couldn't stop him. Uh -huh. He was going to do it no matter what. For example, when the circus came to town, mm. he would volunteer to march the banner for the circus around the town okay. all day, nonstop, <laughs> on his feet, back and forth, just to get a free ticket in the evening. Okay. At which point he'd sit at the front row of the circus and promptly fall asleep oh because dear. he was too exhausted. <laughs> and he did the same thing with the the cinema. When mm -hmm. a new film would come out, he'd volunteer to wear the sandwich board all day uh -huh. so he could get a free ticket to get into the cinema. Oh, very diligent, hard yeah. working. And he sticks out at school. He's very popular. He gets mm. into a lot of trouble with the teachers, but the teachers also quite like him because uh -huh. he's cheeky in the best of ways. Okay. The narrator, on the other hand, feels like he's actually invisible he compared himself. to you, okay. Yeah. Um, even his teacher doesn't remember who he is in her class. She's like, are you, are you a new student? I've been in there two years. Oh, no, that's awful. Yeah, and Yuja never seemed to notice him either because oh. he was just too popular. Okay, so, so they weren't really friends mutually. Not not in childhood, okay. but he admired Yuja. Okay. Um, and Yuja had all sorts of plans. Like he wanted to be a film projectionist, mm. but he could never persuade the projectionist in the cinema to <laughs> let him touch the machine. Okay. But because of that, he learned how to wire up loudspeakers. And that got him a job helping a political party in opposition mm. give speeches. Okay. He'd carry this, this anvil-like speaker around with him across the rooftops wow. um, to make sure the message was getting across. And then he got involved in the party. This is as a teenager. Mm. And ends up getting involved politically. Uh, learns how to drive. Is going to volunteer to be their driver until the official loses the election. Wow. But then... He gets a job working for a minister. Oh, and he gets random. His, yeah, he gets his own business cards to hand out. He's actually, you know, he's doing a proper job now. Mm. Starts to become important. He realises that um, he's meant to be going into military service. Okay. And so he forges papers <gasps> to dodge the draft. Uh -oh. He realises that if you have a college degree, mm. you're more respected. <laughs> so he forges a degree certificate. That's a shortcut. <laughs> uh, yeah. And um, then a military coup happens and the minister is arrested. And uh -oh. this job and everything, this perfect life disappears. Oh, no. And so he's like, what do I, what do, I do now? Well, I suppose I better join the military. Oh, he does go. 
Yeah, so he decides to go to his hometown, join the army, and on his way there, taking the train, there's a happy accident of sorts. Oh, let's find out more in our second reading. The man who sat next to Yuja in Hongsung, quite a bit older and grimier than Yuja, and not so foul-smelling as he appeared, got off at Onyang and left a shabby little parcel behind that Yuja did not notice until the train had pulled out of the station. Yuja picked it up carefully and was disappointed it wasn't food, but was glad that it felt like a book, whatever the subject. He opened the parcel, hoping to find something entertaining to read, and found two books. One was a saju fortune-telling manual that can be found on every street corner in Seoul, and the other was the Chun Seok, the thousand-year calendar that was generally known as the companion guide to the saju book. Yuja leafed through the saju book that was written in terms simple enough that anyone who could read could use it to tell someone's fortune just by using the person's date of birth. He started reading to keep himself entertained, but as the train was detained an hour in Chanan dawdled through Jochiwon and stopped for who knows what in Daejeon, the book kept Yuja occupied, perhaps too occupied. People from all parts of the train car lined up to have their fortunes read. Yuja had the Chun Seok with him, so he didn't have to bother using his fingers to calculate his customer's birthday month and year in the sexagenary cycle terms. Since his luck started to take a strange turn for the better, he had no reason to keep his oratory under wraps. With every customer, old or young, he spoke formally in the beginning and informally towards the end, because nothing says expertise like condescension. For the Sajjo reader, the fortune itself was not as important as the interpretation, and the interpretation itself not as important as the clever chatty delivery. He picked up this trick of the trade on the train. Besides, hanging around political parasites had taught him nothing if not the art of embellishment and dramatisation. He added a little detail, here and there, finished with a flourish, and his reading was perfection. That's all in the space of one train journey. Yeah, a few hours. It's a slow train. This is, you know, back in the old days. But and he, yeah. he's now become a fortune teller. He has. Wow. But he's still going to the army. He does, but he's got this newfound skill that serves him really, really well. Oh. He uses it because everyone wants their fortune told. Sure. So he gets a comfy, cushy ride through his military service. Nice. He's got an old friend who's a drill sergeant mm-hmm. who spies him and finds out what you're a fortune teller now mm. and then starts to feed him info on the people who come to get their fortunes ah, told on so the officers and the soldiers. Better. Yeah, so he knows who's having an affair or who's <laughs> arguing with who, and he can use that as he tells their fortune. Wow. And this is where he gets the nickname Master Yu. Uh-huh. So this is where it starts, because he's a master fortune teller. Con master fortune teller. <laughs> well, um, uh, well, one okay. could say that about all fortune tellers. <laughs> uh, and then after military service, he goes from cab driver to chauffeur for a chable president, uh, which ends up badly after a couple of incidents. Ah. The narrator talks about um, when he met Yuja, and uh, he turned up at his publishing office to borrow Uh some books and have a chat, and would talk about what happened. Ah. So one incident was um, the the president bought some uh, expensive carp, and they suddenly died. Uh Um, May have been his fault. (laughs) And the other involves the president's beloved statue of Buddha, which had to be cleaned every morning. Mm. And Yuja got caught trying to remove a stubborn mark from the Buddha's face by um, spitting on the cloth to get it clean. And uh, he loses his position. Oh. So he isn't sacked so oh. much as demoted or sidelined. Okay. And Yuja ends up being made a traffic accident processor for the company. Oh. So he has to investigate any accidents that take place involving their drivers. Okay. And uh, he spends all day traveling around, representing the company, investigating the accidents. Mm-hmm. And with this new job, it's hard, but like anything, Yuja is determined he's going to do it, and he's going to do it well. Mm -hmm. And 
He's going to win the cases he needs to win, but he's Ooh. not going to compromise his morals or his emotions. Oh, that's going to be tricky, but well but done. He, he does it. And, and it's all through hard work and sheer determination, sheer force of will. Mm. So if you're owed fair com- compensation, he makes sure you get it. Mm. If you're trying to scam the company, <sighs> it's a short shrift. Okay. It's not going not gonna to deal with you. Oh, I like him. Um, and also, if there are funerals for these victims... He goes above and beyond his duty. Wow, he's so hardworking. Yeah, and it, like he learns geomancy, he learns dowsing, so that he can help make sure that the grave is in the right place. Wow. Um, he makes sure if he's going to awake that he pays proper respect before he does anything else. Mm. Um, and he also gives cash to those poor drivers who need a little bit, who mm. need a helping hand. So he's doing everything. It's very responsible. Yeah, and so even though he's doing a job which can make people really angry, and sometimes they are, <laughs> having to deal with, you know, this investigation, mm-hmm. they're all really grateful at the end of it. Oh, great. He's, he's doing good work here. And he's friends with lots and lots of writers, as we said at the start. Mm. And he helps them out too if they've got problems. Nice. Because he's got contacts at hospitals. So if they're in in, in hospital and the doctor is not bothering to see them, Mm. one visit from Uja and suddenly the doctor's popping in twice a day to say, how are you? Wow, influential as well. Yeah, and he actually ends up working in a hospital as a chief administrator at a private general hospital. And there's one incident the narrator tells us about before he resigned. Mm. And uh, you'll hear that in part. Three. Your daily right. dose of Korea. Korea. Right now. Listen up. Arirang Radio. The June 29th declaration broke out that summer. Labourers all across the country took to the streets. The protests spread all over Seoul like wildfire. One day, a large group of labourers swarmed into the hospital where Yuja worked. They were all injured, some of them gravely. It was up to the chief administrator to decide whether or not to authorise admitting injured persons who required long-term care. Apparently, the labourers had been protesting layoffs when a tear gas attack herded them into a building where, unable to escape, the labourers had jumped out the second floor windows. Yuja ordered their immediate hospitalisation. The hospital director summoned him. He showed him the medium-length article in the society section of that day's newspaper and demanded an explanation. These people had nothing. How would they foot the bill? They had been fired after a dispute with management, so their companies weren't going to pay. The government sure as hell wasn't coming to the rescue. The hospital director was right to be concerned. In lieu of an explanation, you just said that the hospital exists for patients. I'm holding you accountable. Hold away. Yuja's argument with the hospital director thus ended with Yuja himself acting as collateral. The patients recovered sw- speedily. Many of them had completely recovered but were held hostage at the hospital until they could pay their hospital bills. It was time for Yuja to take responsibility and he knew exactly what to do. There was only one way out of this anyway. On a Sunday, when only the doctors and nurses on call came into work, Yuja orchestrated the patient's escape and submitted his letter of resignation the very next day. This was his last gift to the needy. Now that he was unemployed, the illness he'd been staving off overwhelmed him. In fact, he had not been successfully staving off anything. He had simply been too occupied with a patient exodus to look after himself. Oh, is this the end for you, Ja? It's it's getting there. Uh, it's downhill. Um, he's diagnosed with cancer. Aww. He's only got a matter of months to live. Um, But then one of the writer friends passes away. Uh And so even though he's desperately sick, he puts all his energy into helping with the funeral arrangements. Oh, that's nice of him. Yeah, and then 100 days later, Yuja passes away. And the narrator, he ends the tale with a poem that was written by a friend, a prose poem, and Mm. then a poem of his own. And they're both in tribute to this master of human life. Wow. And it really is a beautiful eulogy. Mm. Um, This really quite strange and wonderful human 
who decided that he was going to dedicate his life to doing his best at whatever he did, mm. but also making sure that others around him were well cared for. It does seem like a real story. This, this, this is not like a real person. I'm 99.9% yeah. sure this is real. I th- I'm sure there could be some embellishment sure. here and there, but this is a, a life lived, it feels mm. like. And, and the, the way that he writes this, it feels like we're taken back into the past. Mm. It's a different career. It's also a little bit of a polemic. Uh It's like his ranting against the changing of the world. Mm. Look at Yuja. Look at at his traditional values and attitude and the way he helps. And this is what we need to keep, not this selfish industrialization. Ah, I see. Maybe encapsulated in that hospital story where they weren't even going to take the patients. Exactly. Mm. But what's a hospital for if not for patients? So the whole book feels a little bit like a rallying cry for community. And it's a really good reminder, I think, at, even in 2023, that, mm. that we need community and that yes. we need people around us when we're in trouble, but that we should also be there for people who are in trouble. Mm. It's really important. Um, and it also reminds me of something that I admire and respect about Korea, mm. and that's the funeral system here. Yeah. I'm sure you've talked about it on the show before, yes. Yes. that you have these three to five days of mourning. Mm. Um, and it's like it's a... It's a continuous wake yeah so anybody can come to the 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 room in the hospital mm-hmm. which is dedicated to uh paying your respects and you yeah. will you will bow to the photo or you'll say a prayer you'll maybe place a flower you'll mm. offer your condolences and then you'll go and eat and drink and talk and you'll also leave money yes um to support the costs right? exactly So you're able to share your grief Mm -hmm. and share your stories, but also you're you're able to financially support the family. And I think it's a really good way of doing things. It's very different to the Western funeral system. But like... Like, I, I guess if you're looking at it in that light, I didn't think of it like that when I did it recently with my mother-in-law. I thought, oh, three days, like 24-7, mm. it was really exhausting. But it also gives people the opportunity to come and support at any time across those days exactly. for as long or short as possible, as, as they can, like, yeah. set aside. And, and I feel like, yes, it is hard on the family, but at the same time, grief is really important and Mm. the grieving process is really important and in the UK for example it's all too easy to just shut down and deal with funeral arrangements rather than actually start to process what has happened and Mm. process your loss Um, and then it also made me think that about community as well that we think about community at death we think about it with births Mm. and we think about it with weddings those big events (laughs) yeah but we need to think about it all the time yeah Um, what I love about Adidang Radio one thing that that throughout over the 10 more than 10 years i've been here Mm. on and off is that there is a community yeah it feels like there's a community in the office Mm. among all the staff and the djs and the guests but also online also the listeners i mean every day we see on daily k Mm. you know um the same faces the same voices popping up to chat and to talk and to help each other so this is i think a tribute to everybody who takes part in community and wants to be a part of community. Absolutely. What a tale. Hartley saying very wisely as well, the point of life is not avoiding death, but living and making your mark. It really seemed like Master Yu, Yuja, did that in this story. Yes. Uh, even maybe it didn't make the headlines in global news or anything like that, but helping out his fellow community members. That's fabulous. Uh, Blazing Saddles also on board saying, Paul Matthews, BBC Radio 4 misses you. For that comment alone, Blazing, you can win today's Talk To Me in Korean voucher. Tatamaka! Send us your email address with those five letters and that'll be winging its way to you. You've inspired Nian again who wants to buy this book too. Is it a short one? Have we covered the main points today? Yeah, but it's, it's a novella. It's a mm-hmm. short story. It's one of those bilingual editions from okay. Asia Publishers where you've got the Korean on the left and the English on the right. It nice. may be a little harder to get outside of Korea, but okay. if you can, I hope you really enjoy it. Um, yeah, and there are lots of books. Um, next week, we've got a great book. Okay. Next week is Bluebeard's First Wife by Ha Sang Nan, <laughs> translated by Janet Hong. It's a selection of short stories. Wow, sounds like a pirate tale. Bluebeard. <laughs> you don't know Bluebeard? <laughs> Who's Bluebeard? You don't know your fairy tales, Peter. No. Peter Ben, this is your homework for this week. Wow. To find out who Bluebeard is. In Korea? No. Oh. In, I, I believe it's a French fairy tale <gasps> originally. Okay. Oh, Not Blackbeard. Then. No, Blackbeard's Very the different. pirate. <laughs> Bluebeard is the man who had a number of wives. 
uh, not many of whom survived. Oh dear. Okie dokie. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Paul, for your wonderful reading today. Uh, uh, thank you to you. Thank you to everyone. Thanks as always to Asia Publishers for the help with copyright permission for this broadcast. Thank you to Yimung Gu for his writing and to Jamie Chang for her excellent translation. And yes, I will be back next week with another book. All right. Have a wonderful you week. You can listen to Check It Out with Paul Matthews on Adidang Radio's Hashtag Daily K every Wednesday from 10am KST.